Hi, I'm Adam Hudson. I'm a uh, partner and senior consultant with Clear Health Benefits. The best part of my job is really working day to day with my clients, learning more about their organization and how we can bring cost effective, sustainable solutions to their organization and their employees. Ultimately, listening to you know what their needs are and and working closely with them to address those those needs, wants, concerns going forward. Hi, my name is Jeff Bremner. I'm the National Vice President, MGA Distribution for the Partner Solutions Division of People Corporation. The best part about my job is spending time in the field with my team and getting to know these amazing advisors that we partner with across the country, what's really important to them and what's important to their clients. You have questions? I'm wondering, what are my employees' top well-being needs? How to implement a good organizational health in my company. How can I ensure our group coverage meets the needs of all of our employees? We're here to answer them. Hi, welcome to the Beneva podcast, Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Catherine Duranceau. In this episode, we'll talk about how to establish organizational health that is adapted to everyone's needs in a company, what are employees really looking for in a group insurance plan, also how to inform and educate employees about the resources available within a group coverage. Hi, Adam and Jeff. It's a pleasure to talk to you both. Now, for the past years, you've witnessed the significant changes in the industry, especially since COVID-19, of course. Tell us what important insights should organizations consider when they're working on a solid organizational health framework? Um, I mean, I think there's lots of ways that you can build a strong organizational health framework, but it doesn't really matter how great it is unless you've got um, buy-in from, from leadership and the governance to support it, right? So, you know, if I think about leadership working 80-hour work weeks and sending out emails at midnight and, uh, you know, sending out emails all day Saturday and Sunday, as an example, it's not a really great message to send to the rest of the organization. So I think that often employees sort of mirror the behavior and the values of, of their leaders, right? And so if that's what's being put out there as, as a value to the organization, you're likely going to end up with a lot of unproductive and uh, burnt out employees. Mm -hmm. um, conversely, when an organization promotes uh, a healthy workplace, you know, healthy employee well-being, chances are you're going to end up with, you know, very productive employees, uh, very engaged employees. So Not really, encouraging people to do 80 hours a week. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Because, I mean, ultimately, we know how that's going to end up. Right. It's going to be OK for a while. And then it's and then things are going to fall apart. Yeah, I know. I mean, to Jeff's point, I mean, I think that, you know, everything starts at the top and it rolls its way down from there. And I think you've got to have that buy in from leadership. You have to have the commitment uh, from leadership as well, because at the end of the day, the employees are looking up to those leaders. And in a lot of cases, they're trying to you know follow what they're doing. And if uh, you know, you've got leaders that are engaged, uh, well communicated, uh, I, I think your organizational framework from there will have a buy-in all the way from top to bottom. Uh, and I think your employees, again, there's a lot of communication that goes on you know, within the employee group itself. They're looking to their leaders for guidance. They're looking for commitment. They're looking for engagement. They're looking for transparency. And, and I think that all comes from the top. And I think when they see that on multiple levels within the leadership group, they themselves are there to follow and, and work towards a more productive workplace. Um, I think that's something that we all have to understand that we have to try and maybe reconfigure our train of thought in the workplace with that approach. And we have to have that work-life balance. And that work-life balance comes with access to a multitude of tools that, you know, plan sponsors have access to these days. Mm -hmm. But Adam, is it a bigger challenge to understand and accommodate the needs of different generations within a company? I believe it is. I think it still comes from an actual understanding of what the culture of a, an organization is. An organization has to take a step back, take a look at the culture that they have within, uh, look at the generational kind of mix, demographic mix that they have within because there's going to come with different uh, level of demands, wants, needs. Uh, you know, you've got younger employees that are coming into the workforce and they're not as set up in their lifestyle. They're, mm -hmm. they're looking to save for purchasing a house, which we know is extremely difficult these days. They have different level of yeah, demands, <laughs> concerns, young families, 
where you have your older demographic that maybe they're a little bit sedentary in what their lifestyle is. They already know, they've already planned for their retirement. They've paid off a majority of their mortgage. Uh, so I think those challenges do come into play. And I think an organization has to be aware of that, but be able to communicate what resources are available to all levels. And for mental health, maybe different generations are more open to talk about it also. Absolutely. I think it's hard to say. I think when you look at the the older demographic, they hold their cards a little you know closer to home. Whereas when we start looking at the younger demographic, they're a lot more open. I think social media has, has triggered a lot of that. Uh, I think you've got to look at the resources through EAP programs, uh, additional kind of wellness initiatives that an organization might put out there, uh, different communication, you know, avenues that an organization can use um, to, to promote mental health, wellness. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of tools and information that can be extremely beneficial for organizations out there. And, you know, going back to the very first point is that leadership has to be committed to that. Um, it, it, it's only going to have a stronghold and success if you have that leadership commitment. So that they could look up to someone and try to be good in their job, but without being burnt out either, because that's not the point. Exactly. I believe it must be also a top priority to equally consider diversity within a group. Absolutely. As we talk about demographics within a group, we're looking at, you know, diversity. I mean, people are coming from all different cultures, um, all walks of life. They have different, you know, commitments within an organization. Um, so we have to embrace diversity within an organization because, again, by embracing diversity within an organization, it helps to the ultimate success and cohesiveness of that, you know, that organization and, and ultimately the success, the growth uh, and productivity as a whole. Absolutely. And if you tell us a little bit about those practical steps can employers take to address mental health effectively? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it really starts with promoting awareness and, you know, back to Adam's point, reducing stigma around mental health. And so this can all be achieved through education, right? Things like workshops, seminars, could be timely articles that are being sent to employees, uh, could be, you know, a, a wellness newsletter that, that the organization creates to send out to employees. You know, ultimately when employees are well-informed, they're better able to, to understand their own mental health. Creating that supportive culture is going to be ultimately you know, really, really important for employers to their employees, fostering um, a culture of, of empathy, you know, inclusivity and, and open communication, where employees actually feel safe, comfortable, expressing mental health concerns that they're having. And, you know, you can only do that when it's a trusted environment, right? Absolutely. You need to feel confident to be like, I'm not going to be judged if I ask this question or... Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, again, creating an environment where you're talking about these things together as a group, you know, ultimately is going to make people feel a heck of a lot more comfortable about being able to bring it up with their leader when they are having some challenges, right? And then yeah. equally, it's really important to make sure that managers and supervisors are, are trained to be able to identify where somebody who works for them may be having a mental health challenge, um, sort of be equipped to be able to manage that conversation or at least get them in touch with the right people the right resources. Mental health is taking so much space in our lives, but to talk about it is, I think, one of the ways to make it better. Yeah. Can we say that group coverage evolved during the years? What changed? I would say that there's a growing emphasis on having more personalized solutions available for plan members and their dependents. I think things like, you know, an employee assistance plan, while great and covers a broad spectrum of physical, mental, financial, emotional health. I think that as things progress in the coming years, we're going to see a lot more targeted solutions, right? So solutions that are very, very specific to mental health, solutions that are very, very specific to chronic disease. And ideally, I hope we get to a point where you know, instead of putting an EAP as an example in place for all employees and thinking that's going to work for everybody. Work for everyone, yeah. That we, that we start to get, you know, moving towards a position where we've got a platform that has access to a whole number of different solutions and allow employees and their dependents to choose what it is that works for them. Because I think ultimately that's what's going to improve employee well-being and ultimately reduce costs for the benefits plan. But specific to solutions, um, I think as an example, like, you know, wellness, wellness accounts or personal spending accounts 
are probably going to become even more relevant. Uh, I say that because you saw that 2023 Benefits Canada survey, you know, what employees are saying is most important to them is exercise and sleep. And I can't think off the top of my head, you know, how many providers have really gone down the path of solutions that are dedicated to sleep, but we all recognize how important that is. If we can help employees sleep better, that has a positive trickle down impact on the rest of on the rest of their health. Now, things like exercise, obviously really, really important as well to employees. You know, you can provide some flexibility there through personal spending accounts where there's funds that are set aside for things like gym memberships and mm. exercise equipment to, to, to work out at home. Um, so I think that we're moving in the right direction, but I think that's what we're going to see as the the next wave personalized solutions and a lot more focus on exercise and sleep. You know, to Jeff's point, the younger demographic are more connected. Uh, I think they're more informed of, of what's out there, what, you know, is potentially available to them, but they're more connected in and in tune with their own health. Uh, you know, I think when we look at, you know, some of the older demographic, they didn't have access to some of the information that's out there now. And they I didn't I, have TikTok. You know, that's with, right. WebMD. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of stresses right now in, in, in our world, right? You know, with, with regards to our own health care. So, you know, access to virtual health care is, is a significant one. You know, we've got a lot of young families out there. And if we can avoid those long trips to, you know, the walk-in clinic, the emergency room, or trying to get a, an appointment with your own doctor, and you can access that in, you know, 15 minutes to half an hour. I think that's critical, right? Um, you know, and going back to just point on personal spending accounts or wellness accounts, I think ultimately with the the changing in the demographic as, you know, baby boomers are now exiting the workforce or, or soon to be over the next, you know, coming years. And with the younger demographic, they're all looking for choice. They're looking for flexibility. You know, we have to lean on the insurance carriers at this point in time for them to start understanding that and putting together greater tools and program availability to support what these demands are. Certain organizations or certain insurance carriers that do have, you know, nice flexible products for small mid-sized groups right now. Companies, yeah. But not all insurance carriers do. And in the Canadian marketplace, a majority of organizations are under 100 employees and even more so under, you know, what, 50, I guess. So I think it's just critical from that standpoint that, you know, the insurance carriers have to look in a little bit deeper and try and find solutions that are going to be a lot more relevant to you know, the employee demographic that we're going to be witnessing in, in the years to come. And it should be top priority. I think we're also going to see a trend towards higher maximums for like psychologists and social worker benefits as an example. Oh, to upgrade. You know, oh, right. Well, it's a little disturbing in the sense that mental health topped the list last year of highest out-of-pocket expenditure, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, if we think about a traditional benefits plan that's got a $300 per practitioner maximum or a $500 per practitioner maximum, the cost of going to a psychologist or a social worker is is two hundred dollars an hour. Somebody some, somebody's going to get one and a half to two and a half sessions out of their benefits plan, but we know that it's going to take a lot more than one and a half to two and a half sessions for people to get, you know, where they need to be. And so there's a lot of additional cost that's coming out of out of the employee's pocket. So when we think about what are the top three stressors for employees right now, well, it's personal finances. It's workload and it's work-life balance. And so, so work is there a lot. Work is there a lot, but personal finance is being number one. And if people are stressed out about personal finances and then they don't have a psychologist and social worker benefit that gives them the coverage that they need, then it's not going to go well, right? And so we've seen a lot of companies like, I think Starbucks was the first one that I can remember. You know, they went to a $5,000 maximum on psychologists and social worker. You know, maybe that's that's on the high wow. end for sure. But certainly some organizations are going to, you know, $1,500 maximums on psychologists and social worker and then leaving all of the other paramedical benefits at a $500 maximum. If we can get employees using more non-pharmacological avenues like therapy, maybe that then contributes to a reduction in, in drug costs not only a reduction in drug costs, but then maybe less employees also going on disability, which then takes some of the financial pressure off, off the benefits plan. But I, I understand it must be tricky trying to give that personalized solution, but at least if the employers are trying, we're getting there even more so. But if you tell us, what are the benefits of promoting employee uh, well-being? Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, you know, I think a lot of employers have come to realize that there's 
uh, a really strong ROI that's associated with having, you know, happy and healthy employees. There's a lot of really amazing statistics out there, like, you know, mentally healthy employees working in a supportive environment are up to 12 times more productive, up to eight times more engaged than their less healthy counterparts, right? And obviously, that's going to have a, a positive impact on, on performance for the organization. You've got, you know, reduced presenteeism, reduced absenteeism, uh, unhealthy employees, they take up to nine times more sick leave than, you know, wow, than their, than their times, healthy counterparts, right? Which that's going to disrupt workflow. That's going to have have a negative impact on the organization. I think unhealthy employees have greater healthcare costs, right? I think that there's the sort of the compassionate benefit, but there's also, you know, a bit of a strategic benefit here as well for employers to, you know, to really focus yeah. in on employee well. Jeff makes a great point. I like the the strategic benefit of it all because at the end of the day, when you take a look at all the benefits of providing a very comprehensive, robust, you know, health and wellness program to that strategic side, I think what we're looking at is it's a small investment on the mm -hmm. front end to incorporate some of these benefits and communications and resources to your employees that we can now, you know, maybe step away from that presenteeism and absenteeism and reduce, yeah. you know, short-term disabilities, long-term disabilities. And if we can reduce even, you know, the level of medications individuals are taking, or we can isolate the proper medications for mental health related illnesses, which is, they have those resources out there. There's- Pharmacogenetics, you know, right? Pharmacogenetics, yep. and that's exactly it. So when organizations can start kind of accepting and, and engaging with some of these resources to provide a, a better kind of healthy landscape for their employees, I think ultimately for them from even a cost standpoint is significant. Uh, your ROI on that just from productive employees and an organization culture, I think is significant you know, through it all. But I also think that it's it's really important right now for employers to start thinking ahead. And I say that because, you know, we go back to the different generations that are in the workforce right now. So currently, I think it's about 54% of the Canadian workforce is made up of baby boomers and, and Gen X, right? Mm, wow, but what's expect that's a lot. <laughs> it, it's still a lot, right? But over the next five to seven years, that number is expected to drop to 25%. Wow. And you're going to have an influx of millennial and Gen Z employees in the workforce. And what do we know about millennials and Gen Z employees? They're very, very comfortable talking about mental health. They're very comfortable about talking about their well-being. And they place a really strong emphasis on that, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I've heard that currently... Uh, Gen Z employees, on average, stay with an employer for two years and three months. Mille two years and three two months? Two years, three months. And that's not a lot. It's not a lot. And millennials are two years and nine months. And that's that's relative to Gen X that's over five years and, and baby boomers that are typically over eight years on average. And so when we start thinking about what's going to happen over the next five to seven years, I think that there's a lot of investment that goes into training and developing new employees. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you want to retain them, you want to keep them. You want to retain them. You want to make sure that they're engaged. And, mm -hmm. you know, we know that Gen Z millennial population, wellness is really important to them. So in order to keep them engaged, it's going to be mm -hmm. really, really important for organizations to put a lot of emphasis on organizational health so that they're able to retain those employees long term. Absolutely. When it comes to group coverage benefits, what's important for the employees? What are their key considerations? Well, I guess it goes back to, you know, having that conversation about having a, a multi-generational workforce, right? There, there's different demands depending on the demographic of a group, mm -hmm. right? So absolutely, I think that, you know, the older demographic within an organization are are somewhat still traditional in nature. Um, you know, I think they still kind of put a key focus on prescription drugs and dental and, and vision care. And, you know, some of them are looking at flexibility in, in, in their benefits, depending on what kind of cost contributions are with their employer. But when we look at a younger, you know, demographic, they want absolute flexibility. They want sheer choice in, in it's their like you benefits. you want me there, I want my flexibility. That's right. And, you know, I, th I think that's what uh, an organization has to understand is I, I think they need employee engagement, but I think ultimately they need to listen to the employees and then they need to gain the, the feedback from the employees to try and understand, you know, what's going on within their environment. And, and then again, trying to draft a program that is going to hit as many of their employees in a positive way as possible. 
And it's not, a set, it's not a set it and forget it type of mentality either. It's no. something that needs to be addressed on a, at least on an annual basis, because yep. the, the makeup of an organization changes so much over time where you've got younger employees come in. I've seen a lot of benefit plans over the years where the mm -hmm. benefits have not changed for yep. 10, 15 years. Wow. But the demographics certainly yeah. have. Absolutely. Right? right. Yeah. And, 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 and I think Jeff. what COVID has actually done through all of this, I mean, as much as it's caused us to, you know, take a step back, um, adapt, you know, organizations and, you know, now we're looking at, you know, flexible work schedules and working from home and now trying to re-engage some of the, those employees back into the workforce is, on a is more regular Is it working well, basis. bringing everyone back to work, maybe not five days, but... Well, it's, they're, they're, yeah, it's not on a, you know, back to a five-day model, but, you know, we're no, still working yeah. in a hybrid, but now it, it's not as cohesive of a setup as what was essentially, you know, asking their employees to come back on set days during a week so that everybody is in the office at one point in time. So you've got greater cohesiveness and you've got greater, you know, conversation, greater productivity because, you know, now everybody's there together. Right? And it's fun to be at the coffee machine, everyone together. How was your night? Did you sleep well with your kid? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's all building, you know, that culture, that bonding experience and Work is, you know, right. also a social setting, right? It's not just That's a... That's it. <laughs> so. Jeff, uh, tell us, employees are not always aware of what is included in their group coverage, like telemedicine, uh, employee assistance programs. How can you make sure they're actually well-informed? Effective communication. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, Seems it's... like the basics, it, but... Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's paramount. Employees want to know, you know, what's available to them and their dependents as part of their benefits plan. I think it's really critical for organizations to make information accessible and to make it easily digestible for employees. So accessible meaning, you know, like from a, from a digital perspective, it could be an intranet site, it could be a wellness hub, it could be uh, an HR platform, as an example. In more of a physical environment, it's having posters and, and information in high traffic areas like lunch rooms or or printer rooms or wellness rooms, as an example, in order for employees to feel comfortable, like we have to understand, I guess, that not everybody's an expert in insurance, right? So making sure that that information is accessible to them, but again, breaking it down into smaller chunks, making it digestible, making it really, really, really easy to understand, ultimately is, is how I feel that employees are going to really have a strong understanding of what it is that that they're covered for. And and I think with with organizations and uh, again to to Jess point it's it's about just communication. That that is the ultimate, but there there's multiple avenues of communication. Jeff touched on a, a number of them. You know, there there's some additional ways that you can engage those employees and you can have wellness fairs, you know, and and even a wellness fair is a public forum of of accessing all of the services and resources that are available within your employee benefits, you know, network essentially, or at least showing them what else is out there and what's available. And, you know, from that, you get further employee engagement and feedback as a result. I mean, we've done these with our clients in addition to employee education sessions. And one thing I find with employee education sessions, and, and Jeff will you know speak to this too, I'm sure, but is that when it comes from a third party, so when we have these employee sessions, employees want to come up and talk to us about a personal situation because we still now have to bring it back to reducing stigma in the workplace. And it does you know go beyond even the mental health side of it, but they might have a personal medical issue and, yeah. and, and they want to ask us, on a personal front, they don't want to bring that forward to their employer because they don't know how that's going to be taken in. Received. Exactly. So I, I think that there's, you know, other avenues that, you know, employers can explore for that communication. And, and at the end of the day, that is the ultimate, though, is how do we communicate it? How do we simplify, you know, what's out there and what's available to the plan members? And you could also tie it into national health observances as well, right? So, you know, tying in information to World, you know, World Mental Health Day or Diabetes Awareness Month, which happens to be the month of November, communicating what's available to employees and tying it into one of those types of observances can be a really sort of beneficial way to get information across. And it feels like you're very connected to the world today by doing those themed days. You probably feel it even more in the employees. And I'm curious, when it comes to insurances included in the group coverage, such as life insurance, uh, disability, and critical illness coverage, what steps can be done to improve their comprehension and awareness? 
you know, I think it touches upon what we were just discussing. I think it's just clear communication and, and how do you go about doing that? I think an organization has to understand you know, how their employees are going to receive the information, how they're going to digest that information. What is the best avenue of communication or mode of communication for them? You know, is it intranet? Is it emails? Is it employee education sessions? Is it smaller employee education sessions where people have a greater comfort? Because, you know, the tendency is that if you're part of a large group through an, an education session, certain plan members are probably less likely to stand up and ask a question, right? It's intimidating, Exactly. So maybe, you know, you, you kind of, you know, shrink what those employee sessions look like. But ultimately, it's, it, it goes to that same kind of mode of communication is key. And, and I think an organization knows the culture that they have in place and how to best engage their employees so that they do understand what they have included in their employee benefits program, the value that that brings to not just themselves, but in some cases, more importantly, their family members. Mm. Do you ever get into personalized consultations with plan members? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Oh. From an organizational standpoint, you have to pick an advisor partner that is going to bring another level of services to not just your organization, but your plan members and have, if it is one-on-one -on -one sessions with, with plan members or have that open door that they can reach out to you at any time. Because unfortunately, I think that organizations take a lot of this on their own. Their shoulders. Yeah. yeah, And, and, and not think, the experts. And they're not right? the experts. Yeah. And so they're now burdened trying to answer questions or researching when you have, you know, that level of expertise with you in your consultant, or we, we hope they do mm -hmm. in the right partner. Absolutely. Adam and Jeff, thank you so much for this great conversation. And uh, we remember vacation time is important too. think about ourselves. <laughs> thank you so much. Jeff, is there a moving or funny story you'd like to share with us today? Yeah, I mean, I can tell I can tell a quick story. Well, it's not necessarily specific to, I guess, organizational health per se. It, it, it comes back to the need for communication and education with employees. And, um, you know, my wife and I got married in Mexico back in 2008. And um, likely as a result of it being an all-inclusive and open bar, I had... I had a couple of really close friends of mine um, have to go to the hospital on consecutive days with uh, with the need for stitches. Oh boy! And uh, <laughs> yeah, probably not not either of their their finest moments. But um, you know, at least at least when that happened, they both had employers that um, did a really great job of effectively communicating what was available to them through the benefits plan, uh, out of country emergency coverage being one of those things. So they knew exactly what needed to happen when the injury occurred mm -hmm. and, um, you know, made the call that they needed to make and probably could have gone a, a bit of a different way if, um, you know, they weren't prepared uh, in the event something like that happened. So another great example would be something like a medical second opinion, right? When somebody that's, uh, you know, a dependent of yours is diagnosed with, you know, something like cancer, as an example, it's, you know, knowing that you've got a benefit like that in your back pocket is incredibly valuable. But the only way that employees are really going to understand that is if the employer is communicating effectively with them, making it really easy for them to, to access that information and make, it, make sure that it's digestible for employees. So Adam, can you summarize our conversation and remind us what should be done to really prioritize the employee's well-being? You know, it, it goes back to you know, our initial point with leadership. And I think the leadership within an organization has to have a, a thorough understanding of the culture of their organization, you know, the employees within their organization, the, the generational gap within their organization. And, and I think they have to work closely with a, an advisor uh, that's going to be well-versed in, in the landscape of, you know, employee benefits, health, wellness. I think they have to be proactive in nature uh, instead of reactionary. And I think if they are ahead of the curve to address, you know, some of the immediate concerns that we have right now in the, the employee landscape, such as mental health, I think they will, you know, ultimately be ahead of the curve in their own organizational growth. And as, you know, Jeff had mentioned with some of the statistics with how long, you know, employees are, you know, remain with an organization, it is critical to understand that 
and to see how that's going to change in the years to come. Right now, going back to the mental health side of it all, again, is that to be proactive in nature, but have clear communication to channel some of the resources to their employees and make them aware of what is out there, what's available to themselves. You have to do a really good job in communicating it. Mm -hmm. Collectively, I think organizations starting from the top can do a really uh, good job on a proactive side, communicating in a very clear, transparent, and digestible manner, but at the same time, get employee feedback and input on what is available Mm -hmm. and what they would like to see available to them in the years to come. To personalize it, as you've been saying. Correct. Thank you, Jeff and Adam, for sharing all those valuable insights about prioritizing the health and well-being of employees in an organization. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate and contact us at podcasts at beneva.ca. If you would like to have more information about this topic and discover other episodes, we invite you to go on Bineva's website in the podcast section. Stay tuned for another conversation that will guide you for future insurance and business needs. Until next time.